welcome if you're watching online this morning and we're going to uh, get into the second part of our series on This Is Us. And if you've been in the room, those who are watching online, they've been asking the question, if you could be a microwave or a toaster, what would you be? Um, I, I don't know what I'd be. Well, the answer, the answer will come out in a, in a little while. Um, so I'll say what that means in a bit. Um, but in it, well, actually, I might as well say it now. Of course, it depends on what you want to do, doesn't it? Do you want to toast something or do you want to defrost food? That's the point. So hopefully some of you had that answer. Last week, um, on the 11th of June, we heard from uh, our guest speaker, Melissa Lipset, um, who is from over east and works with the Bible Society now, but used to be at New Life Uniting Church. And Melissa has something great to share with us, which just set us up beautifully for this focus of the next month and a bit on, <coughs> on us, the church. And uh, we, we call this Billabong community, this, this church, um, a church. Um, we even call buildings churches, which doesn't make a lot of sense considering the meaning of the word, because God's family or, or followers of Jesus who are gathered and scattered wherever or whenever they are together, this, this is the church. This is, this is us, right? The church is not the building, it's the people. And God has given, sorry, God has chosen to put this unique thing called the church, this sometimes dynamic but many times very imperfect organism, he's chosen to put it at the, cent- the very centre of his plan for the world. Um, never has God given up on the church. Never has he, he given up on us as, as the church. Even when a church dissolves or closes or moves on to something else, the church continues on with every individual member um, a really important part of it, the church. And so our, our theme for these months is, is simply... Is, is us, that all of this, all of this that God is doing is us. What God has said um, about us, the church, and what does he want from us um, as a part of the church, but also as a congregation, a church, the Billabong. Because it's, it is a new season in many ways for us. Um, it's a season to, to consider where God is taking us next. It's also a new season for the Uniting Church, the movement of which we are a part. Um, and this Thursday, that I think it's Thursday, the 22nd, is the 40th anniversary of the Uniting Church, when a number of other ones came together and formed the Uniting Church. The 40th anniversary. And uh, the theme for the birthday is, hashtag, if you're on Twitter and all that, all of this is us. Um, all of what Jesus is doing in his church, we get to be a part of it together, which is exciting. And so I'm going to... Pr- uh, sorry, there's a, a lot of things which Jesus said about us, about the church, um, which are really important. Many of these things uh, Melissa touched on last week, and we'll kind of return to them over the month, next month and a bit. Um, the first one is that Jesus said, I will build my church. Um, G- uh, that's the next slide. Jesus will build his church. Um, and so I'm going to pray... Uh, first off, and then we'll read the passage where Jesus said this, where he said, I will build my church. So uh, let's pray. God, thank you so much for this church. Thank you so much that we get to be your church in this place, along with brothers and sisters in Christ all over Canning Vale this morning, all of them uh, listening to what you might have to say to them, all of them worshipping you um, with open hearts, and not just here in Canning Vale, but all across the world, millions and millions of people. Thank you that we get to be a part of that. Something that Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, started 2,000 years ago and that continues today and will continue forever until you return and bring us home. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us your word to speak to us this morning and more importantly, your Holy Spirit to speak to us through those words. And so we pray that you would not just allow us to hear you, but really listen to you and let it sink in. Thank you that you're a God who's alive and a God who speaks. May we be receptive and obedient to you in Jesus' name. Amen. This, um, this passage from Matthew 16 is a very important moment in the, in the process of Jesus preparing his followers to carry on his work. If, if you think about it, remember that Jesus was, he only had three years from his baptism through to his death. This was the time that his ministry happened. He only had three years to change the world. That's not a very long time. 
And most of his followers, who he invested into, were gone by the time that he, he, he died. I mean, he, he invested his life in those three years in a very small band of followers, and that was all he did. And even that didn't look very successful. But it turned out to be a movement that was launched at Pentecost, which continues today. That is the genius of what Jesus did. And this passage that we're going to read is a, key, a really key part of that. Jesus is with his disciples at this place called Caesarea Philippi. And there was this cave in this place called Caesarea the Philippi that was literally thought of as the gate to hell, the gates of hell. This cave that had something to do with the, the pagan beliefs of the area as well as the fact that there was this seemingly bottomless pit in this cave, inside this cave. And so the disciples would have known, what, whatever their belief, this is not a very godly place. This is like where people think hell is. And here, in this place, Jesus asks a question. He says, when they came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? That, that was a title that he used for himself, the Son of Man. Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, others, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, that's the, their prophets, or maybe one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Sorry, John, I can just hear a real ringing if you just turn it down a little bit. Who do you say? Big moment. Not like, who do others say, but it, I'm asking you now. Never mind about the others. And Peter steps up to the plate and he says, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah. That means the anointed one, the promised one of God, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you are blessed, son of Simon, John, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you, you are Peter. So he changes his name. He gives him a new identity, which means rock. And upon this rock I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Literally, it means the gates of hell, the gates of Hades that, we, that you think with that, that is here right now. This, this cave entrance thought to be the entrance to hell. This evil will not overcome my church. That is what Jesus says. Now, there's lots of debate of whether the, the second rock here upon this rock is the same as the first and whether it means Jesus is building the rock on Peter or Jesus because Jesus is also referred to as the rock. Uh, Dwayne Johnson is not the rock. Jesus is. Okay. There's no point getting tied up on that, though, because we know that on the one hand, Jesus used Peter to kickstart the church at Pentecost. But on the other hand, and on the long term, the church was and is built on Jesus. He's the foundation. He's both the foundation and the head of the church. What's important here is who Jesus says will build the church, and it's Jesus. Who builds it? Jesus does. Now, the foundation is Jesus and his people. There's no church without Jesus. There's no church without us. We are the church. But Jesus will be the one who builds it. Not for a while, not until uh, we return to, to, or go to heaven, not, not until denominations are established. Or, or He says, I will build my church, period, forever, until I come again. That's my job. And he says that your job, Peter, is something else. Now, he doesn't kind of leave it there but says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid or bind or lock, it could mean, on earth will be forbidden in heaven and whatever you permit or loose or open on earth will be permitted in heaven. And this is, this is huge. And if there's one thing that we would take home today, it's this, that Jesus will build his church we are to release heaven on earth. Now that sounds like, uh, that sounds scary, but it, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in the next uh, 15 minutes. What is heaven? What is the, this kingdom of heaven? Is it you know, little babies with wings and harps flying around in the clouds somewhere? No. It, it's not even the place we go when we die if we believe in Jesus, as you might have kind of heard in, you know, oh, you go to heaven after you die. The kingdom of heaven, what is that? What is the kingdom of God? Because it's the same thing. Matthew uses one term, Luke uses another term in what he writes because they're writing to different audiences, Jew and non-Jew. But kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, same thing. What, what is this? 
It's about God's rule and reign. We sang that in one of the songs. His rule and reign. A kingdom sounds like a geographical place, like, like the kingdom of uh, Rome or something like that. But, but it's not geographical. It's a reality. It's a way that things are, and it comes from God being king and not us being king. A better term might be the kingship of God. A rule that is characterised by love and grace and joy and peace and hope and a lack of all the other stuff, death and sin and selfishness and all that. And I mean, Let me say that again a little bit more slowly. A rule that is characterised by love and grace and peace and forgiveness and hope and has no death, sin, selfishness. Sickness, pain, greed, all of that. It's a counter-reality and it's breaking into this world. Amen? Amen. A counter-reality that's breaking into this world. And the language that Jesus uses with Peter is that he will be given the keys. Now keys, of course, unlock and lock again. They release and hold in. Your job, Jesus says, is to open, to release this rule and this reign of love of God on on earth. And we understand now that the Spirit's been poured out, that this isn't just for Peter, this is for us. We hold the keys to the kingdom. The church is able to release the incredible reign of God on this earth. But Jesus will build his church. There's a difference. I'll come back to how we sort of release heaven on earth because that kind of sounds like, oh, what does that mean? But before we get there, are we content with this, that it's not our job to build the church, to grow a larger congregation, to start new ministries, to plant churches, to, to, bring, to make people followers of Jesus so the church expands? Are we, are we content with that? Let me ask you this question. If you were one of only 10 people left in this church, this, the Billabong, next Sunday, because Jesus chose to build his church by moving 150 to 200 of the rest of us somewhere else, would that be okay with you? Would it be okay that the style changed and the kids' ministry reduced to your two kids and there was no one your age anymore, but that Jesus knew what he was doing? If, if that was the case, could you, could you trust that Jesus is building his church and you are simply called to follow him? I admit, I would struggle with that a lot. I'd say, Jesus, we were building something good here. Look at the room. There's kids, finished, there's kids going everywhere. And, there's... and Jesus would say, nah, I was building this. And this whole thing is just a few bricks in the overall thing. You just follow me, whatever, whatever it means. And in the next verses of this passage, we read that Peter is reprimanded for doing exactly what I'm talking about, for getting in the way of Jesus' business, not focusing on his own. Jesus says that he's got to die and rise again. I'm not going to put this bit on the screen, but he's got to die and rise again because it's God's plan. And Jesus, sorry, and Peter says, heaven forbid. A bit early, you didn't have the keys yet. He tried to take over Jesus' business. He tried to, to, to get in the way. And, and we do the same sometimes. Here's what I love, though. If we let Jesus do his thing and we did our thing, if we played the role that we were meant for and let Jesus do what he has said he would do, it would actually be so much easier. It would be so much more just, that's it. <laughs> Releasing heaven on earth doesn't sound easy. It sounds scary and risky, and sometimes it is. But here's why I asked about the microwave and the toaster. Have you ever tried to toast bread with a microwave? (laughs) Sarah said yes. I'm not sure. (laughs) Have you tried to defrost? This is even worse. Have you tried to defrost frozen food with a toaster? That wouldn't go so well. Yeah, until it starts dripping down into the element and then the, the power goes out. I mean, <laughs> wrong purpose. Things work better when we do what we're meant to do. So what does it mean to unlock heaven, to, to play our part in releasing the kingdom of God? Put simply, it's doing what Jesus did or living like he lived. Now, not what, what he does now, but doing what he did 
That is what a disciple is. They become like the rabbi who they follow and eventually do what the rabbi did. That is what it meant, the fact that he had disciples, these followers. Jesus, he had the first set of keys. He released heaven when he was on earth. He unlocked the kingdom of God. And then he cut the keys and gave them to his disciples. And that sounds scary because Jesus was Jesus. So to say, oh, just do what Jesus did, it's not, it's not like that easy. We're not Jesus. But I want to encourage you today that you actually can do what Jesus did and live like he lived. You can speak like he spoke. I believe I can. And I, and I promise I'm not bragging when I say that, that I can, I can be, do what Jesus did. Um, and uh, the reason I can say that, like, guess how many... So how much do you think of my theology degree and my experience as a pastor and my Christian conferences and training has to do with, do, with, with living like Jesus? About that, that much. And really only because that has shown me about that much this truth, that I can live like Jesus because the same spirit that raised him from the dead lives in me. Amen. And if you've repented and, bapt- and been baptised into the family of God, same goes for you. He lives in you too. And so that is what we must keep in mind. Of course, the experience and the growth and the learning and all that that kind of of thing comes into it. It might not be that much, but it's only so that we realise more and more the other truth, that his spirit lives in us. So with that in mind, I want to suggest three ways that Jesus unlocked heaven on earth that we can follow in the power of the spirit. The works, sorry, the words that he spoke, the works that he did and the way that he lived. Easy to remember because it's three W's. That's like the most common letters you see on your computer when you're up at night on the internet. WWW, right? Jesus had a message. His words were a message of good news. He wasn't a silent monk. Nothing wrong with monks, but he spoke. He, there was good news that needed to be spoken. And when he spoke, the kingdom of God was released. This is how he brought the kingdom. He spoke it. Our tongue is one of those keys. The tongue has the power to bring death or give life. It's in the Bible. You can give life with your tongue. Romans 10, 14 and 15. But how can they call on him? How can anyone call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how uh, can they hear about him unless somebody tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? And that is why the scriptures say, How beautiful are the feet of messengers, messengers who bring good news. I ask you to read the things that Jesus said. You'll find that he spoke life to people. He spoke good news to people. And you'll see how he did it. Jesus' words were not some well-packaged message that was just sort of stock standard. It was contextual. He spoke with people where they were at. And we are to do the same when we do, when we speak the gospel. And when we do, the kingdom of God is released. But we need not be frightened by it. I, you know, me included, we kind of go, oh, I don't know if I can do that. All we need to remember is this, that we speak what we hear. We're like children who imitate our parents. At a young age, Micah said, Dad, da, first, because I said that to him more than Karen said, Mum, mum, to him. <laughs> Is Karen still here? I've got, got, okay, yeah, yeah. Now, he did say, Dad, da, to Karen the other day, but that's beside the point. Um, <laughs> he hears these words and so he speaks them. Same thing. Read and listen to the words of Jesus and then we will learn to speak his message. With confidence. Let's do a, a little exercise, and it's okay if you, you kind of you, you don't feel like you succeed at this very well. I want you to think for just 10 seconds about something you remember Jesus saying that was good news. Okay, just 10 seconds. Okay, hopefully you've got something in mind. I want you to turn to the person next to you and in five seconds or less, share with them good news that comes from that. Okay, gather your thoughts. You've got five seconds. Go. (coughs) 
Okay, next person, switch, five seconds, go. Alrighty, that's good, thank you. That's 10 seconds up. I know that went really quickly, but... And it was a cliche kind of exercise because you only had a few seconds to do it. But really, that's, if we know what Jesus said as good news, we have everything we need to be able to share something. Now, contextualizing takes practice. Meeting people where they're at means relationship and love and getting to know people and actually giving our lives to them. But when it comes to the words of Jesus, we have them. And just like children, we can hear them and then speak them in response. You can do it. We can do it. All you need is to hear them first. The works of Jesus gets a little more challenging. Jesus unlocked the kingdom of heaven by his works, what he did. Caring for the poor, giving hope to the hopeless, loving the lonely. Those things are challenging but doable. But then there's also healing the leper and opening the eyes of the blind. You might say, I can't do that. Why not? What is harder? To build the church? To bring someone to faith so that the church grows? To build the church? Or to pray for someone to be healed in Jesus' name and let God do his thing, let God do the rest? I can't tell you the number of hours that we spend on building the church. And yet... Sometimes all of that, probably because Jesus said, I'll build my church, sometimes all of that feels like it's banging our heads against a brick wall. But the other day, one of our small groups prayed for a young person who's blind. Doctors said, never see, we'll never see again. Next day, she walks into this building and she says, I can see the trees. I can see the cars. I can see the, I can see the light pole. Wasn't... That didn't take like 40 hours of, of trying to build the church and strategize and all that kind of thing. It was a simple prayer. I'm guessing no more than a couple of minutes spent to pray that. What is easier, to try and do Jesus' job or trust that he's given us authority to do ours? Sure, we won't get it right all the time. We'll burn the toast. But if we try to be a microwave, <laughs> you get the picture. Of course, to do the works that Jesus did is not about kind of some random excessive attempts to do miracles or something. It's about obedience. But listening, it's about listening closely to God's voice and obeying what he asks of us. We can do that. You can do that. And that leads me to the third thing that's often neglected about how Jesus brought the kingdom of God to earth. His, his words released the kingdom, his works released the kingdom, but the way he lived also released the kingdom of heaven onto this earth. I want you to think about the way he lived. Now, there's many parts, of course, of the way that Jesus lived, not just one thing or another, but one of those was that he rose early in the morning to spend time with his heavenly Father. So let's say we, to do, we were to do that, to, write, to, to rise before everyone else in the household just to spend time with God. How would that build the church? How would that grow the body of Christ? The answer is, it doesn't need to. Because you're not building the church. I'm not building the church. But it will release the kingdom of heaven. First of all, into our own hearts. Second of all, into the hearts and the lives of those who we pray for. Because the Father is so ready and willing to answer the prayers of his people. He's pleased to answer our prayers. The way Jesus lived, getting up early for time with his Father, was a key part of his unlocking the kingdom of heaven on earth. It gave him perspective to step into what God was doing. Prayer opens heaven. And so let me talk about that for a minute. I could stand up here, and often I do, saying, come on, we've got to pray more. What opportunities are we missing? Because God's waiting for us to ask. And to be honest, that's my tendency. I know I'm a glass, half-empty kind of person. And that can be a good thing sometimes because there's a desire for more. Other times I recognize it can be a discouraging negativity. So I want to come from another angle today and ask, what kingdom growth has come about in this community because some of you have been praying behind the scenes. How has God brought people into this family? Because some of you have obediently, 
obediently prayed in the background, God, please bring people to faith. Please build your church. You may not realise that a prayer you prayed had a, had a direct consequence, that someone came to faith, that the Father was pleased to answer your prayer. When you said, may this house be a place of refuge for someone. Maybe you're discouraged because you haven't seen the fruit and yet God has answered your prayers. In fact, he was delighted that you asked and pleased to answer you. You just maybe haven't realised it. Did you know that people have given, even in recent times, people have given their lives to Christ in this building on the very first Sunday that they stepped into the church? That doesn't happen if his people don't ask. Now, it can happen because God can do anything, but the Father chooses to let us bring his kingdom to earth, and from there, he builds it. He builds the church. (coughs) Keep being obedient. Your prayer in that early place in the morning or whatever it is for you, you have been bringing the kingdom of God to earth. Thank you for doing that. And this is us. This is We can do this. Keep on praying. Keep on asking. Without those prayers, some people who are here today, having received eternal life with God, may not have even heard the life-changing and experienced the life-changing gospel. Jesus will build his church. We are just to live his way, alone with the Father before dawn. But also, you know, he lived with God and with people. He lived in sacrificial community with others. Close family-like relationship, not by blood family, but people he called his brothers and sisters. Did you know that that brings the kingdom of God to earth? Living that way, meeting in the temple and homes regularly, even with outcasts and the very opposite of religious people. We might say, well, that doesn't build the church. It's not meant to. We're not meant to build the church, but it does bring the kingdom and Jesus from that will build his church. You know, next Sunday, as an example, I may need to arrive here a little late and then leave a little earlier than usual because in that evening, my non-blood family um, are having a party with non-Christian friends that we believe might, God might be drawing to him through us. We don't know. Some of them... You know, I mean, if, I'm not concerned about bringing them to church because some of them can't stand the thought of a church. But I do want the kingdom of God to be released in their lives because that's our job. Whether Jesus adds them to his church or not is his choice. So where does this leave us? I mean, we're, we're talking about us, the church, the community of faith. That means all of this is that as we head into a time of discernment about goals and and vision and who we are and what we do, especially um, in July. We remember this one truth that maybe is what it all comes down to. We don't bring people to Jesus. We bring Jesus to people. Jesus will draw people to himself. We simply bring the rule and reign of Christ into people's lives. We don't need to try to build the church by pushing people into the kingdom. We're meant to bring the kingdom to them and let Jesus do the rest. Because really what we're doing is we're showing them the king. We live his words, we we speak with his words, we, we do his works, we live his ways, we bring Jesus to people in a nutshell through love. I mean, it's, it's, they were words of love. They were works, sacrificial works of love and a way of life centred on love. That's what Jesus did. Release the kingdom of heaven, the kingship of God, the rule and reign of love. We do that, Jesus will do the rest. Father, thank you that that is the truth we can take away today, that there's not this pressure on us to do something we weren't designed to do and purposed to do. And, and the two are very close, Lord. As we bring the kingdom to people, it's part of drawing them into the church, but we don't need to... We don't need to force that. You have infinitely more ability to build the church, even to build this church, than what we do. And so we ask that you would do your thing and help us to do ours. I just want to spend 30 seconds just to listen. What is it that God's highlighted for you this morning?